our job here does not change in either scenario. Now, it'll be easier if Trump wins. You'll have a little more money if Trump wins. The economy will improve. Your gas will be cheaper. Your groceries will be cheaper. All that kind of stuff if Trump wins. But your job doesn't change. Right. Your duty doesn't change. So do your duty. Live faithfully as a narrative creature in narrative swimming in this water. Don't feel like you have to be over here in the sewage. You can go to the clean water and pay a little less attention. Met a ghost of a king on the road when I first fell. Fire burning to my knees, to my knees I fell. Met a ghost of a king on a road. Okay, this is SASF episode 165. Yeah. And we are going to talk about various political narratives today. Yeah. Because a lot has happened while Nate has been dark. So many things. <laughs> I went dark for a little bit. Um, I thought there was a podcast host strike that I was participating in. Turned out it was um, half of the podcast. Yeah, it turned out it was just me. Um, uh, I sold you out. <laughs> <laughs> Brian scabbed yes. the, whole, the whole time. I was like, I will still work. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so we're, we're coming out of the dark. I would say there's a few things right now. One is I really thought that they would make Kamala president prior to the election. And I'm very surprised that they didn't. I think they've left that tool in the tool bag and it was a mistake. Uh, if you're just, just practically, just strategically, manipulation, control, trying to trying to win power. Give it to didn't. her first. Yeah. They didn't do it. Yeah. Uh, so I was completely wrong in predict- predicting that one, but I'm, I'm very surprised they haven't done it. Now, of course, maybe they'll do this between when we record it and when this airs. That would be really uh, <laughs> lovely. That would be a real joke. It would also be funny to do it after the election if she loses and do it in the lame duck period and just, you know, have fun. But we're in a, we're in a position right now where we're, we have no president. There is not currently well, a That's what known- I was going to say. Don't you think it could be Joe? The fact that Joe is... Clearly, so upset with how this there all is went down. No known president. If you told him he was still running for president, he would think he was. Yeah. We don't have a president right now. We can't even have a lame duck because we don't have a duck. I don't know. After what the, metaphor after is. the it's election, a duckless place. There are no ducks. It's, at all. We have a. We're gonna have a duckless <laughs> presidency. Um. But anyway, the narratives have have kind of like flown around. I think our country is, as everybody would agree, is in a pretty bad place. And a wide variety of people are susceptible to narratives, confirmation bias, and so on. But the speed with which people will embrace lies that affirm their position. Mm -hmm. um, So you mean putting her in power would have been one move that would get a lot of people to get over there. It would all, a lot of people who are undecided, you can create some momentum, you know, I, I just don't understand why they haven't done it. And I think, well, I, my one my one thought is what my first impulse was, was the power brokers were trotting her out as a, you know, sort of a, a pointless round. They were just going to yeah, throw sacrificing. her. sacrificing. They were going to throw her into this. She was going to lose. She's that reliever that you don't really want They pitching. don't ever have to run her again, and then they can make way for Newsom, et cetera, for next time. But I think there there became kind of a desperate need to win, like yeah. a truly desperate need to win that has shown up and there's all this frantic stress and eye scratching that's been that's been going on. And Tim Walls playing video games. <laughs> you know, that level that level playing of- Madden with AOC. <laughs> that- like, oh, that'll appeal to dudes. <laughs> yeah, <that thing. laughs> it's shocking to me they thought that would work. Wow. Uh, Did you there's- see those guys shooting targets from ten or fifteen feet with scoped rifles? That was the other move the Democrats made is is they were they were fifteen There's, feet away, steel targets, scoped rifles. Uh I I mean I just hope they didn't miss. Well they they, they did and it nicked a reporter. The dude, the dude shot by. the reporter. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, we don't know that he missed. We don't know that it he probably ricocheted. But he wasn't aiming at that reporter. There's been a lot of farce. Um and I would like to say broadly, I think some of the most important stuff politically for everybody who's out there. We we've, we've talked a lot about narrative and narrative structure and we've we're now over 100, 160 episodes in so there's stuff that we could cover again, you know, in yeah. terms of what what we are and what this podcast is in terms of people are narrative creatures. We live in narrative, we live in God's narrative, we are catechized with narratives, our loves and loyalties are established and confirmed with narratives. So with stories we're told when we're young, with which 
you know, fictional heroes we admire, stories mom reads us, stories dad reads us, like who we want to be and how we want to be is established by narrative. Uh, that's the food. That's the soul food. That and if you don't have one, you're going to be sick and upset yeah. and feeling like something is out of whack until you find... Until you find your interpretive grid, your narrative that you're using for even defining who you are, where you are, what the world is, what life is. If you don't have that, you're going to hit despair. You're going to be, it's going to be nihilism and suicide. Um, story matters. Story yeah. matters a lot. Which stories you believe matter a lot. Whether your, your diet is, is made up of healthy and wholesome storytelling, edifying storytelling, storytelling that honors the true, the good and the beautiful, or Storytelling that seeds resentment, entitlement, mm -hmm. bitterness, envy, all those things uh, can be fueled, fed, established uh, in young minds and old minds, anyone consuming narrative, which is everybody all the time. Now, in political seasons, and we can't stop ourselves from consuming narrative, we're fish in the sea and water is narrative. Like we're just in it all the time. And you can be in muddy, filthy water, or you can be in clean water, but you're in water. Like we're all existing in, in narrative. In political seasons, there's this really horrible thing that happens. Uh, and it happens to both sides, where we accuse our opponents. Like we, we try to steer our opponents with accusations, and we accuse our opponents of being certain things. Now, this could be straw men. We could be making stuff up. We're trying to insult them, and ultimately what we're trying to do is shame them into defeat or shame them into moving, shifting their position. But what we're, what we're really doing is identifying the enemy we want to fight. Like we are, we're identifying the brand we want them to have. We're trying to brand our opponent mm. and brand our opponent's narrative. So what is the narrative yeah. of Kamala and the left? It's socialism. It's power. It's control, you know, it's all these things. It's uh, hatred of white men. It's hatred of men. It's hatred of Western culture. It's hatred of God. Like, there's all these things we try to hit them with. Last time around, uh, when Trump beat Hillary, so not last time, time before last, when he went with nasty women, and he <laughs> called Hillary's supporters all nasty women, it's a perfect example of how humans behave. Because he was saying to them... I want you to identify as this brand. This is the brand I want to fight. Nasty I want women. you. I yeah. want you to identify this brand. You know, with this, with this brand, I'm attacking you as this thing. How quickly did they all adopt that brand? Yeah, really quickly. Super fast, right? Mm -hmm. They were so nasty, so fast, and they actually became more nasty. It wasn't like they just were what they were, and they said, "Yes, I guess we are nasty." They went and started knitting vulgar hats and wearing their vulgar, obscene yeah. hats to protest and, and marches. And you're right. And so I'm now on. having mem mental memories of, or uh, memories of people saying that, just drawing out the phrase "nasty women" on stage and shouting it yep. loud and happily. Yep. And what and a em, failure em, there. And, em, <laughs> and embracing it. So Trump calls her and her supporters nasty women, and then they say, "You know what? Fine." You want to fight now? We women? will stand under the bucket above the doorway exactly where you wanted us to stand. <laughs> right? We And they positioned themselves there mm -hmm. as nasty women and got defeated. On the flip side, she called Trump supporters deplorables. Right. Now, that was more vague, a more vague category, and had to do with relationship uh, to people who despised them um, than nasty women did mm -hmm. but how quickly did the right identify as deplorable yeah so fast we're selling t-shirts we're deplorables right. it's a brand we are deplorables the right went there really really quickly now this is where it gets really really ugly is because for the last i don't even know how long a long time the left has been accusing the right of being racist mm. and for the first time in my life i'm seeing a bunch of idiots Say fine, yeah. Let's be racist, right? And just walk into that narrative. Just walk into the narrative. Now, the the thing that's horrible about it is that that one, especially unlike deplorable and nasty women, that comes with lots of extra envy, resentment, and a narrative that you're telling yourself about your role 
Uh, if if they're anti Semites, for example, with the Jews, you know, controlling yeah. everything. Yeah, the um, noticing crowd with the federal agent Nick Fuentes being yeah. their leader. You know. <laughs> yeah, it's just like we're gonna we're gonna go be racist. We're gonna be anti Semites because we've been insulted as that. We're now going to embrace that. We're going to explore that. And you see the sim- just the simple mindedness of crowds, and how when they are not fed healthy narratives how vulnerable they are to absolutely toxic, awful narratives. So when people start to feed on unhealthy narratives, and so they, mm. they weirdly, like you think about the cocktail right now, if, if you know, my son's applying for, for college right now and you have to identify, uh, you don't have to, but they want you to identify your race. And they specifically, in one of these applications, include white, including Jewish you know, including uh, this particular strand. So Mm -hmm. whiteness, what is whiteness? Whiteness is a terrible, terrible narrative. Mm -hmm. It's really bad storytelling. And it includes everything that we don't like. And you have, uh, you know, everything despicable about Western culture. And whiteness has been scolded, white fragility, you know, white supremacy, all this white, 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 you know, stuff. And the danger of that narrative has been in cr- the creation of the category of white. So I have felt affection seeing somebody from the part of Scotland where my ancestors came from. I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, cool. Like, yeah, there's a weird tribal affection. I don't feel any of that for Russians, for Germans, for Italians, for Greeks. It's just like, oh, cool. Like, Neat. You guys had a great culture, or I like this culture, or I like this thing about your culture, or whatever. But the Irish and the Scottish and the Ashkenazi, which is where my my cocktail comes from, I'm like, hey, neat. You you guys are hilarious. You're ridiculous. Or there's there's funny things about Scotch, Irish, Jews. Like it's there's a lot of humor there. Of uh, but the collective brand of white that includes Vikings, and what else? Like we're including the Jews, we're including the Greeks, we're including the Russians, the French, the German. We're I mean, even the Spanish, right? Yeah. <laughs> so. Yes. We're just we're just expanding out to include this massive category. Uh, and the same thing happened with blackness uh, yeah. before. Yeah. You know, the erasure of all these distinctions and tribal distinctions and regional distinctions, and it just went with tint um, and created this unhealthy category. But now I see poor idiots becoming loyal to just the concept of people who sunburn. Mm. Like people, I have loyalty to people who sunburn. I mean, it is, there's some empathy there as you see someone sunburning (laughs) really bad. Maybe, I don't know. You're trying to connect it, but it's like, (laughs) what are you, what are you talking about? I mean, it's just, it's so, it's so bizarre, but also watching these poor, these poor idiots go stand where their enemy would like them to stand. Yeah, they, go be racist. They've carefully drawn the, sh- yeah. the shoe prints in in chalk underneath yeah. the gargoyle that's about to be pushed off the roof. And 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 there's this phase of resistance where people have gone from we're not racists to fine, I'll stand there. They've just been berated for so long. Like fine, I'll stand there. They're like Samson and Delilah, where you think, how stupid are you? Yeah, to finally give her the truth. To finally yeah. give her the truth when she's she's obviously on the other side. How dumb are you to finally give in to all this berating and stand where she wants you to stand? And these these poor saps are walking over and being like, I guess I am into white pride. I'll stand here. Yeah. And they're just lambs to the slaughter. It reminds me of the children's crusade. They're all just going to get on the boats and get sold into slavery in North Africa. It's just... Mm. You know, it's well, it's horrific. Okay, so I was reading up on uh, irony and then also satire. Yeah, it, it as as story types, and was just realizing that we're living in that kind of black comedy. We are where there's very dark comedy. Yeah, where it, the one where you the characters don't see the the ridiculousness of the rules that they're living under, and the whole point of the story is that because the characters don't see the ridiculousness, then the audience feels it even more powerfully. Right. So with yeah. the black comedy, it finishes with with no, usually death. <laughs> yeah. Usually it doesn't work. Usually, usually annihilation. Yeah, usually yeah. completely all the rules are done. And you can cut it a little bit if there's a friend who's been trying to tell the main character, don't, you know, don't do this thing. And then finally yep. the friend is able to walk away at the end with like, wow, I tried. But that that feels like what is happening. In the same, the same right things now. happen. So while 
the left has worked very, very, very hard to try to lever and exploit white guilt and to um, like I wrap white guilt around people's necks for being racist. Yeah. A bunch of people have given up on having that be a false charge and they've decided to have it be a true charge and no longer feel guilty. Yeah. Like just like raw, fine. Yeah. But on the flip side, conservatives have been accusing the left of wanting to destroy free speech and be totalitarians. And they have done the exact same thing. Right. And they have finally through this election cycle come out and just said it directly. Yep. You know, like they're now saying, yes, we are against right. free speech. Well, I think that's part of that reactivity you're talking about with Kamala, where you watch her trying to find a narrative that'll stick. And, yeah. and the only one that seemed to get purchased was abortion. Like they tried so hard to do the project yep. 2025. Thing. Didn't didn't work. It didn't stick. Then yep. they moved on to abortion, and that's the only one that had any purchase. And then, of course, that moment of, uh, I can't remember, was this was this your dad who said this? The moment of genuineness where Kamala made fun of the Christians at her rally. Yep. <laughs> As the yep. first moment. Authenticity. He, the first moment he'd seen her ever be authentic. And, yeah. and so, like, yeah, you know, uh, it, watching the, her try to find a narrative for her, her platform has been crazy, especially when she doesn't yep. appear to stand for anything. And the most, the most important thing right now is she doesn't stand for anything except for now totalitarian power and the anti- limiting of speech, yeah, the, the control anti- of censorship, right. limiting speech, uh, prosecuting people like Musk, and abortion. So she's for all these awful things now. She's been accused of that repeatedly, and now she's just embraced it. Mm. But the same thing's happening over on the right, mm. where a bunch of idiots... And I hate, I hate this so much, watching the left be like, you're fascist, you're fascist, you're fascist. And I know we're 30 seconds away from a bunch of morons being like, fascism! <laughs> like, because they, they insulted us. They called us nasty women. They called us deplorables. They called us fascists. So let's go ahead and be fascists because it makes them mad. Because mm-hmm. we just start fueling off of you know, the anger of our opponents. But I think the most important thing right now, obviously, I would, I would much prefer Trump to win. I very much prefer Trump to win. Yeah, as you however, said, we can pray for that. <laughs> yes. However, anybody listening to this, your hope cannot be in this process. Your hope cannot be in DC. Your hope cannot be in the deep state or in the evisceration of the deep state. Your relationship has to be with God the Father, creative creator of heaven and earth, who is controlling this entire anthill who's telling a great anthill narrative. And even though this is the end of an empire and it's the decay of the anthill and everything's shaking down, the sun is still shining. The mountains don't care. Uh, and yeah. your job is what? To be faithful where you are, to be faithful in your moments, to be faithful in your days, faithful in your relationships, go vote, go pray. Yeah. But whatever happens off in Rome as the Caesars fight, as the Caesars fight and feud, if you place your hope there, you will always be betrayed. Always yeah. be betrayed. If we're given peace, if we're given a little freedom, if we're given a little, you know, a little break from the income tax, it could be great. I, I want Trump in office. That would be lovely. My joy is not linked to that. I yeah, cannot you- have my joy linked to that at all. I am not on that roller coaster. I will not ride that roller coaster. Yeah. It's like I just cannot have my my joy there. And I think none of us can. Yeah, you're right. We have a father who spent the last 24 hours on the clock replacing skin cells yeah. for you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yep. He, he was like, ah, no, I'm still doing this work, and we've got 40,000 of them to replace. The, the <laughs> creatures that he cares about, um, you know, and as we see in Proverbs and other places, Job, um, he's, he's listening to the ravens cry. He's feeding the lions. He's doing all these things. He's maintaining all these things. The, the, the bottom of the ocean He's feeding creatures that no human will ever see. Mm-hmm. He's giving them whole lifespans and arcs and narratives and conflict, you know, tension and resolution, and he's providing for them. He crafted them, and he loves them, and no human will ever see them. The, you know, the corners of the galaxy, you know, the universe and on, where he is intricately crafting storms, you know, mm-hmm. energy, light shows that only he will ever appreciate. Yeah, but only he will. I mean, ever I see. think we just got the most detailed picture I'd ever seen of a sunspot. Uh, yeah. recently it was going around on the internet, and I thought, "Wow, we still have these grainy black and white photos." But God's been doing sunspots 
Yep. With crazy explosions from the beginning, of, uh, of huge magma flares, and radiation, and everything. Yeah. Just how many awesome sunsets have there been that nobody's ever seen? How many great waves on how many great beaches? But how many amazing narratives of, you know, hummingbirds and flowers when no one knew about them? Solomon never even knew about hummingbirds. They they were in the Western Hemisphere only. Mm, that's true. And so all of civilization prior to that expansion, prior to um, the early colonies coming over and populating the Western Hemisphere. Nobody had ever seen or thought of a hummingbird, just at all. They thought all um, birds were flappy. <laughs> yes, <laughs> flap, flap, flap. And the same thing's true of the platypus, like way out in the, you know, way out in Oz and Tasmania and all the marsupial narratives and the hilarity going on with marsupials. God is in his heaven and he is not scared. Yeah. He's not worried this anthill that we are part of is in a time of total tumult. Mm -hmm. And we would like it to calm down and be better run. We would like that. But it's an anthill. This is an anthill. And the stakes uh, are much lower than we'd like to admit. We are much less important than we'd like to admit. Mm -hmm. So trust God that he knows what he's doing, but then look at your duty in front of you. Like, what is your duty today outside of your front door? It's not solving Ukraine. It's not figuring out the Middle East. You have relationships. You've got a spouse or parents, siblings, children, friends, neighbors. You've got people in your immediate orbit, and you are supposed to live faithfully yeah. like in their presence and around them. You're supposed to treat your lawn a certain way, your dog a certain way. You're supposed to look at the sun and the sky and the clouds and have a certain reaction of appreciation, a, a certain relationship to God the Father. And that doesn't change whether, you know, the left and tyranny wins in the anthill mm -hmm. or the right and a really weird, we don't even know what's going to happen, wins in the anthill. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I think this is an important test. You know, the big tumult right now in the anthill is the fact that you can't find Trump on Rogan on YouTube when you search for it, right? <laughs> you know, it's it's hidden, right? Even though 34 million views are there alone. Yep. Um, but the better test than calling out YouTube as the cabal of leftists that it apparently is. Um, I bet it's run by white people. Yeah. White people were the worst. Yeah. <laughs> Pro probably some Indians too, if we're talking tech companies. <laughs> so um, <laughs> fine, Brian. <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying. Uh, but then, but the thing that's funny is that test of like, yeah, I'd rather complain about YouTube being a bunch of leftists. How does your wife view you? That test is yeah. always, it makes it nice and real when you yep. realize, oh, yeah, it's actually, am I, am I getting along with my wife and my kids? Are you, well, if we're talking to husbands, are you destabilizing your wife? By stressing out, are you destabilizing your kids by yeah. by worrying about this, by being all caught up in this? Right. You're already teaching them how to like sip the narrative of outrage and loathing of your fellow man. Like, <laughs> are right you now. are you catechizing yeah. them with the wrong narrative? Yeah. Are you stepping inside of this narrative where this is the ultimate struggle between good and evil, which we do every four years? Mm -hmm. And on the right, this could be the last election. And on the left, He's Hitler. <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> everything is so amplified and farcical. Um, and are you like platforming that narrative into your own home, into the psyches of your children, into the emotional well-being of your wife? As a wife, are you doing the same thing? Are you actually being the warrior, the engine of fear in the home? Right. Or are you, are you being the stories? Yeah. All the Instagram stories, the are, are, which threads. basically, if you are a parent at all, if you are an adult at all then you are imaging and telling stories. You're imaging and telling stories with your life, with your mood, with your interpretation, with your actions, with what you're doing in the day, with how snappy you are, with how irritable you this are. This is the Stories or Soul Food podcast. You're giving, <laughs> you're giving the mantra right now. Of, yeah. This is, this, I yeah, mean, this is it. <laughs> you, yeah, this, this is it. This you is are it. a character in scenes, and your scenes are actually a very long way away from this tempest in the teapot that's going. Yeah. So all of this uh, unrest, all of this chaos that's going on that could absolutely result in riots. It could absolutely result in even more unrest because of all the people who are buying into this narrative on both sides, that this is the ultimate existential struggle. This is the struggle that matters in reality, in life. This is what gives life meaning on this planet right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. And it just doesn't. 
Yeah. It just really, really doesn't. And But I want it to matter so much. <laughs> well, <laughs> this is not to say that I don't care. This is not to say I'm not going to vote. Of course I'm going to vote. It's not going to say that I wouldn't yeah. pray that Trump would win. Of course, I would like more peace. I would like more freedom, not less. I would like to be able to operate keeping more of my money. Mm. I would like to be able to do these things. I right. would like Canon to grow. I would like to right. continue to invest in the things that we're building here. And I think that Trump would provide us with more of an opportunity to do that. Mm -hmm. But I also know that God frequently works his narratives and his moments of expansion, like massive expansion, come through times of persecution yeah. and times of hardship. I mean, think about we were looking back on COVID, right? And the whole yeah. shutdowns there and how we thought, oh, man, we're this close to having some big network being like, no, we won't carry any of your stuff. You know, and and just realizing, oh, actually, God uses those things to grow us way more than we would yeah. have if Trump had won. His times second of term of times of persecution and hardship have been used historically to spread the gospel and cause revival over and over and over again. And what we ultimately need in the United States is repentance and revival. Like that's what's necessary. We don't need one party in charge or the other party in charge. Yep. We need the we need new men and new women. We need the race of people to be made new yep. and to open their eyes and to get off of all the different lie trains that they're participating in. So all these different narratives that people are feeding on that make them feel like they matter or feel like they're part of something, mm -hmm. and those can be racial narratives or just political ideological narratives. They can be any number of things. But get just get out of that. And, and realize that you live in direct relationship with the creator of the universe and he's giving you scenes. He's giving you scenes in your daily life. Nail them. Yep. Nail those scenes. Yep. Like, like that's the goal. So wake up in the morning and nail your scenes. Nail them. You actually Walk get a out. lot of takes on those. Yeah. Things there. <laughs> it, it, like nail it with the with how you respond to the day, with how you respond to the things that go wrong in your day, with the stressors in your day. And do not like start mainlining the drug of all these false narratives, you know, and getting all jittery. Uh, just like detox and be faithful. Mm -hmm. Be faithful to the people in front of you. Be faithful to the people who are wearing Harris Waltz shirts, the people who are wearing Trump shirts. Yeah. Be faithful. The neighbors that have all the wrong yard signs. All the wrong yard signs. For some reason, the people with the right yard signs in our state don't put them up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just, it's just it's the a wrong given. One. Just it's, the it's, wrong it's, ones. it's kind of a given. Uh, anyway, the, the point is right now, we are in one of those heightened moments when lots of storytelling is happening. Mm. Meta narratives are being thrown around and, and being sold to people. And we also live in a moment when people are dipping into absolutely absurdist narratives yeah, that, via social media. That black comedy. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, that's what it is, is the absurdist narrative. And I think you, you're talking too about, um, you know, the... Just what's happening is Trump allowed us to start saying we felt like we could say the truth again, right? After being lied to about the COVID thing, you know, and all that situation. I actually don't Trump, think he makes us feel like we can say the truth. I think he makes us feel like we could say whatever. And that's where it goes because once you get that feeling of like, hey, I said something outrageous and it I was said so something freeing. naughty <laughs> and I would have I would have been in trouble a minute ago, but instead <laughs> I said something naughty and I'm not in trouble. Ha, yeah. ha, ha, ha. So I guess maybe that's just very freedom just, over very freedom of speech. We're it's just transgressive. Yeah. It's transgressive. So we've been tied up in all these weird social virtues and for somebody to just kick the virtues over and be rude. Mm. It's like, ha, 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 ha. Yeah. Johnny was disrespectful to the teacher and there's this whole destabilization of, of manners mm -hmm. that's going sure. on that people are participating in. And it's, um, it's pretty, I mean, it can be pretty funny. There can be a lot of really great memes. But um, the moment in time is just people getting sucked into this rings of power story where there is no ring of power. Like mm. there's just, it's not Mordor and it's not Gondor and it's not, you know, this this big heightened uh, Which is devastating thing. advice coming from a from a podcast that loves oh, yeah. applying Lord of the Rings to everything. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, Lord of the Rings does uh, <laughs> apply to everything. This is way more uh, in the Shire. This is a lot yeah. more like politics and Hobbiton than it is sure. uh, Christ versus the devil. Mm. Um, and you are 
Christ on your Twitter account. I think <laughs> I'm not saying that disrespectfully. That's what people think is they're like, I am on the good side. <laughs> yeah. uh, the fact is, if I if I actually looked out and said, where is the devil working right now? I would say, well, weirdly, on the left and the right, and this old bitterness, this old spiritual bitterness against uh, the oldest son, against the Jews, is just flaring up hilariously mm. and comically, and in ways where there is no logical origin for why it would be happening right now. Um, and it's... That's the only place where I say, like, this is clearly, there's there's something satanic going on. There's something spiritual going on. Fruits of the when, devil. I yeah, believe. fruits of the devil. It's so <laughs> evil. You have to pronounce it like that. Like, fruits of the devil. Um, that's from uh, So I Married an Axe Murderer. <laughs> yeah. But it's, which there are filters for, incidentally. Mm, um, a Halloween movie <laughs> with filters. With filters. But mm. it's, we're sitting in a moment where suddenly people who don't even know what Judaism is, they don't know anything are suddenly like what the Babylon B guy was Jewish. He's a converted Jew. Ha <laughs> ha. I knew it. I've never felt so crazy. Also made me feel old where you try to discuss with someone. You're just thinking like, I'm sorry, young whippersnapper. What are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> like, what is happening? Where is this coming from? Uh, and it's yeah. like, well, on the one hand, I think it's coming from everybody having been scolded for being yeah. racist for so long. And so they're deciding to actually try some. On the other hand, I think there is something dark and spiritual going on that's creating people on the left hating the Jews and people on the extreme right hating the Jews. If you want to go find something that somebody who wants to pretend to be a Christian nationalist and AOC agree on, it's the Jews right now. Like, it's this weird thing. Is that horseshoe theory? It's, where it's it weird. Where back around and yeah. we get the, the two ends of the it's horseshoe. It's bizarre. And let, let me go ahead and just say something here that they'll be very confused by, maybe. If you have any kind of white pride. I'm talking to the, the people now who are being idiots and they're going white boy summer and yay white people thinking that there's some loyalty that straddles to whiteness, just paleness. There's some loyalty between the pale peoples, um, which there isn't and shouldn't be. Um, but those people, those people are suddenly anti-Semitic. And it's like, really? If, if you are trying to say that the white race is fantastic, if you're starting to believe that you really want to kick your top 1%, your highest achievers, <laughs> the people who are pulling Nate's being transgressive, uh, the people who are pulling the strings that are steering everything. Allegedly, <laughs> it's like you, you want to like you think they're they're the puppeteers. Yeah. They like they run Hollywood and banking and finance and the new world order, and they smuggled all the Federal Reserve gold off to the Vatican where it's been in a basement. You know, like whatever kind of nonsense you're embracing. Um, it's just nuts to me. I mean, it is nuts, but it's funny to me that there's these groups of people who want to have white pride right now, and they're poor little saps. They're idiots who've been steered by their enemies into standing on the stupid spot where the booby trap's going to fall. They've been steered there. They, for some reason, are mad at the, the race of people that they believe is crazy, crazy high achieving, steering everything for good and evil, pulling all the strings, who are part of their tribe, according to the left, who is scolding the white people. And they're like, we're going to kick you guys out because you're the best at chess. So we got to get you out of here. You're the best at banking, the best at movies, everything else. So get off our team. Uh, mm -hmm. It makes it makes zero sense. I think that's just scapegoat 101, though, right? Yeah. Oh, once, yeah. Once that's my point. Once you've identified, you must eliminate. So you've, you've told that wonderful story of the ants. And under the rock, executing the earwigs. Oh yeah, and that's that's what we have, I think, right here. That was ants looking for earwigs. That was one of my weirdest experiences of all time. <laughs> it's in Tilt a Whirl. Yep. New edition now. Yeah, I mean, and also you buy I think my you, stuff. You started posting. I think you posted chapter one on your Twitter. For yeah, free. I said chapter one, and then um, mm -hmm. the prologue got posted. So I'm like, okay, we'll post chapter one maybe Wednesday. Mm. The first thing, chapter one, right. Will be reposted. The beginning chapter. I'm going to start posting the sections of uh, the Tilted Yeah, World for free because we give stuff away during November. Yeah, That's so we're going to be thing. giving we're going to be giving that away. But one of the weirdest things I ever experienced was mowing my grass, flipping over a rock, and there was an ant hill underneath it, and some earwigs. And I left. I was like, you know what? I'm going to mow over here. I'm going to give you a minute to clear out before I just destroy your world. So here's this apocalypto moment for them. 
uh, I ripped the roof off their world and uh, thrown the rock. And here's this cavity in all these chambers and they're all racing around. And I go off and I mow under my fruit trees and I come back a little later. And when I come back, the ants have not evacuated. They have not taken this time to move <laughs> anything out. It's just as many ants as there were before. But weirdly, they've collected the earwigs and they have the earwigs in the center and they're decapitating the earwigs. And I just stood there watching these ants and the earwigs are doing that torso bend. The abdomen is, you know, torquing mm -hmm. and the pinchers are, mm -hmm. you know, clamping as the ants hold them immobile and pop their heads off and then move on. And I'm sitting here thinking like, wow, like is the scapegoating even happen at this level? Like it was me. It wasn't the earwigs. Guys, it was me. I have the authority to say, not right here. I need this rock to not be in my grass. I move the rock. <clears throat> and then now they're conducting earwig sacrifices. And I don't know if they're trying to like stop the sun god or whatever it is. The, they've the got. queen ant was like, all right. All right. Like, like the earwigs. earwigs. <laughs> I need seven earwigs. I need their heads off. They obviously did this. We hate these things. <laughs> they're obviously responsible. And so the earwigs were getting decapitated. And it was a very odd moment. Yeah. Um, it's very, very strange. And of course, also uh, in the book, I apply it to the incarnation and to looking down at such idiots and then being willing to enter into that world yeah. uh, and be sacrificed in that world is, is incredible. But I would say tying this all in a bow, can people just stop feeding on false narratives? Yeah. And even just recognize when a narrative isn't good for you. Yeah, so, sure. You like know, it may, this one may be something that you can pursue if you were a different yeah. person. Yeah. You know. So should you maybe not eat 17 yogurts in every afternoon? Maybe. Is there, is there anything wrong with yogurt? Well, when you do 17 of them, it's <laughs> going to be a problem. Should you maybe just take the whipped cream can out of your mouth and not do that so much? <laughs> you know, I think whipped cream cans are great. But understand what is healthy for you to ingest. Yeah. We know this with food, at least some of us, you know, try to, mm. we know what's unhealthy and healthy. RFK will tell us, uh, but stories, stories, stories do it too. Stories. And, and when you are dropping into Twitter, when you're jumping onto Instagram, when you're on TikTok, you are ingesting narrative and often you're ingesting highly processed narrative in bulk, yeah, like massive, massive quantities. And it's, it's reinforcing falsehoods or it's reinforcing the truth. It's strengthening you and your affections for the good, the true, and the beautiful, or it's undermining your affections mm. uh, in those things. It's leading you astray into indignation, outrage, fear, worry. Uh, it could be alcoholic. It could be totally intoxicating. And I think it often is. Like People can be completely intoxicated when they just start doom scrolling. And the algorithm knows what hooks them the most and is going to feed you a whole bunch of stuff that's going to tell you all about the Rothschilds and all the things that they've done. Um, whatever craziness, you yeah. know, you're ready to shove in your mouth and go, right. you know, and just take. Right. So, well, I, I did have a question about a particular anthill, specifically the, Washi the Washington Post. Oh, yeah. Um, Otherwise known as Bezos. Bezos Press has decided not to endorse a particular candidate. L.A. Times also. Did they? Wow. Who L.A. Owns, Times. Who owns the L.A. Times? I don't remember. Is but it an owner thing? Because yes, just like, just like the Washington Post. Just the Post. same thing. So what's going on here? Because we have very liberal publications that have been pushing the liberal side for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. Then uh, with, with Washington Post, their editorial board drafted a Kamala endorsement yep. letter. L.A. And, Times is similar. And then Bezos said no. Yep. And then the publisher says, we're going back to our roots of not, endorsing, <laughs> of not a endorsing a candidate since 1988. But we're going back to 1988. It was a really good time, apparently. And then, <laughs> and then people start resigning. Yeah, then protest. all of a sudden they lose a bunch of yeah. apparently really bad eggs yep. or their most experienced editors. We have a situation where So is this a brilliant move from Bezos? Yeah, I mean, it's or not... Or is it just the, an, an ant flailing? What he did is it's hard to argue with it when he didn't say you must endorse Trump. He just wouldn't let them endorse uh, insanity. Mm. So, and as a side note, when you listen to Trump just talk, there's all sorts of insanity, but it is who he really is. He's, yeah, he's just extremely authentic. He's, he's authentically just scattered. I mean, him and, serving fries 
Yeah. It was authentic. Yep. There wasn't him faking it, whereas all the waltz things are all fake. But so pe- the same people thing are Kamala. in the mood. People are in the mood for uh, straight from the barrel. They don't want talking points. They don't want it mediated. Did you see Kamala in the barbershop with oh, all gosh. the black guys trying, trying to pretend like this is the mm. place where news gets shared and all the black dudes were just sitting there watching her? Who's got the tea? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody <laughs> pour me the tea. <laughs> 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 oh, the cosplaying! This is too is too much. It's yeah, really sorry. I interrupted yeah. you. You were saying Trump insanity. Yes, but he's authentic. It's him. He describes it as the weave. Of he's course, just, he's, he's just doing his thing. In as far but as it's he him. Wants. Yeah, it's him. So he's not managed. He's not talking points. He's just blathering, mm-hmm. and he's often blathering. And his blathering is what he genuinely thinks. In that split second. So he's telling you all sorts of random things that he that popped into his head. Whatever pops in his head is coming out of his mouth. Um, mm-hmm. And that's the that's the real deal. And as opposed to, you know, shiny, managed, controlled uh, talking points that results in word salad that means nothing. Mm-hmm. Trump she's is so Trump afraid is just of telling making you, a mistake about a yep. particular thing that she says nothing. And so she's very good at saying nothing. Trump says too much stuff. Like he's just constantly saying too much stuff, but it popped in his head. So he said it and yeah. it's not that people agree with it, but they feel like they're seeing the genuine article and they want to be free to do the same thing and to not get in trouble and not have their hands slapped. So that's kind of, I think a, a lot of the appeal, they also would like to keep some of their money. Mm-hmm. Um, I think Bezos is, yep. knows how much money he'll be paying. If, Elon, obviously. Right. I mean, Elon said like, can you imagine if Trump loses, like I'm going to jail. Yeah, I mean, he's like, they're going to put me in jail. Um, yeah. So I think the Post and the Times not endorsing her is an interesting flex from ownership that will weed out a lot of people, like kind of old media. Uh, but they're dying things anyway. Yeah. And we'll see if they manage to survive. So I, I think the whole thing is funny, and, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. Have you been impressed with J.D. Vance? In some ways, yeah. He doesn't yeah. seem to blather quite as much as Trump does, but yeah, we'll there's there's been stupid things. People were praising him for being on what's his face, Theo, somebody's podcast, Bond. and I was like, yeah, that was dumb. Comedians, yeah, it's like just sitting down with a uh, just a vulgar comedian and laughing while he swears and talks about drug abuse is like, mm, mm. really, is that great? That just tells you how low we've sunk culturally. No, I think that's definitely it. Is that it appeals um, to a lot of people? He like, that's he is highly intelligent and well spoken and quick. He's very debate society quick mm. and was a great asset for Trump on the ticket because he could just run laps around Waltz. And, you know, Vance looks really intelligent and can go out there and brawl anywhere. He's capable of getting into any environment and keeping his wits about him. So he's been extremely useful. And I think a big turning point in the flash mob campaign of uh, Kamala the way they just tried to be like, ta-da, joy, we're mm-hmm. going to win joyfully, and just pulled her out with no primaries. A big tipping point was Vance versus Waltz in the vice presidential debate. Yeah, because yeah. Kamala versus Trump was whatever. Did, didn't. Yeah. It just felt like a bunch of no, It was a bunch of nothing. Yeah. So, you know, nobody really had any advantage there. So I think all of it, I'm looking forward to like, it quieting back down and everybody going back to their normal lies yeah. as opposed to their ones every four year four years lies. <laughs> um, but I, would I think really, we can all hope for that. I would really prefer it if Christians would like become more attuned to the nature of the world itself and the actual gospel narrative and the narrative of creation and God's plan and get less distracted by the beauty pageants of Babylon. Like if we could just get a little less distracted by that. And and focus on being unrattled, no matter what happens. Like mm-hmm. our our job, like our job here, does not change in either scenario. Yeah, like your your job to be faithful in all of your relationships does not change at all. Now it'll be easier if Trump wins. You'll have a little more money if Trump wins. The economy will improve. Your gas will be cheaper. Your groceries will be cheaper. All that kind of stuff if Trump wins. But your job doesn't change. Right. Your duty doesn't change. So do your duty, live faithfully as a narrative creature in narrative, swimming in this water. Don't feel like you have to be over here in the sewage. You can go to the clean water and pay a little less attention. There we go. SASF 165. By the time this drops, 
Maybe your we... doom will be sealed anyway, so freak out. <laughs> <laughs> the world is charged with the grandeur of God, sang the poet. Have you noticed? The smile of a wife, a very good whiskey, the Sawtooth Mountain Range, football in October, first steps, meatballs and spaghetti, a really big tree. Get the things of Earth today.